actually, I think that as we've been talking, we really want to see what the board thinks about this. Sometimes when you have a situation like this, it causes you to change practice. And sometimes you find out in changing practice that it's not a bad thing, that maybe it's actually an improvement. So I will tell you that some of the slides that you would normally be seeing from me, I've moved into Jackson's presentation so that you're not getting uh, duplicate sets, which we sometimes have to do when we are back-to-back uh, -back separated by a few days. So that, uh, I think, uh, is probably one of the things that, that we want to hear from you. What do you think about tonight after we do this in comparison to past years? First and foremost, one of the things I want to tell you is that we do have a theme in this uh, uh, funding request from me to the board. This is uh, uh, the one that I am doing. I think this is my seventh year of presenting funding requests to the board. And uh, I do remember the first year when I had uh, the county executive come back to me at some point and say, you know, it looks like we're going to have additional revenue, so you might think about what else is you would want to put on your list. Um, we haven't had a year like that since, I don't think. <laughs> so anyway, but... I see one of the things that I said to the principals the other day, that I get really passionate about budget. And I get passionate about budget because budget is an expression of those things that we believe are really important to do to advance our work, to be sure that we are really doing the transformative kind of learning that our kids need to be doing in this decade. And most importantly, it's how we send the message that our vision, our mission, our goals, and our core values count and that what we do is what's worth doing. So when I think about our funding request, in my mind, every dollar in it should be an expression of those things that we believe are really important in our work as educators and those who support the educators in the field. This year, the theme is really meeting students, meeting young people at the leading edge of their potential. Now, I have to tell you that what's interesting about that, and you'll see this unfold, is that this is a, the fourth year of a maintenance of effort budget. But I believe that embedded in the work that we're doing right now, that we are taking steps to meet young people at the leading edges of their potential, despite the fact that we are not awash with uh, financial resources. Although I'm going to share with you a little bit later some of the things that I think are important. Um, let me tell you about leading edge of our potential. Here's some stories that I think you'll like about. I uh, happened to, to pull up uh, one of our principal's blogs, actually, uh, the blog from Patrick McLaughlin, who uh, uh, updates periodically on the Henley website things that are going on in the school there. And it caught my attention, and let me tell you why. I think this really illustrates how we're working differently today than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago. It turns out that Kate, the band director there, and Andrew, the band director at Burley, set up a little activity between their two schools. And this is what it looked like. They put their bands into concert mode after practicing and uh, working on, on songs that they were going to perform, pieces that they were going to perform, and they set them up with Skype. They set up microphones. They gave the kids the same rubrics that would be used when they play at district band competition that the judges use, and they let the kids perform for each other, and then the students had to get up and on Skype give feedback to the band on the other side of the screen. Now that's something that's a really different way of thinking about the work our kids do. But let me tell you what I think it represents. It represents communication, it represents critical thinking, it represents creativity, and it represents collaboration, the four C's. So one of the things that I really appreciate is that the technology enabled them to do something they otherwise could not do. The space enabled them to do something that they otherwise could not do. But what really mattered most were the great band directors on either side of the screen that were facilitating kids to work differently. This past week, I had an opportunity to Skype from my office with some kindergartners at Broaddus Wood Elementary, the giraffe class. And let me tell you what the giraffe class did with me. First and foremost, they invited me into their morning meeting, and I had to get up and do a dance move just like they do as a part of the morning meeting. So that was pretty exciting to be in my office uh, demonstrating, remember to swim, to the kindergartners as they were showing me their moves. But then here's what else those kids did. They shared with me self-portraits that they've done this year, and they talked about them with me. They also shared with me stories that they had written. And one young man shared with me that when he grows up, he wants to be a marine biologist because his favorite thing in the world is sharks. That's something that couldn't have happened 20 years ago, enabled by technology, but again, because you had great teachers in a space 
helping to make that happen. Let me tell you about another example of something that's going on in the system that I think represents kids working at the leading edge of their potential. This year, for the first time at Walton Middle School and at Monticello High School, we have students who are manning help desk work for us. What they're doing is that as problems emerge, whether it's with teachers or kids' technology in the school, they can take it to the help desk, and those kids have been trained to troubleshoot and to be able to fix that. Now, they're able to get credit for that, but they're also learning some skill sets that they'll be able to take with them out into a workplace or onto college as part of their, their portfolio package that will really demonstrate to the world, whether it's to uh, an admissions office or somebody that's running a, uh, a, uh, a business related to tech repairs, that they have skill sets that they can use. That's something that's new and different, but again, it's all about those four C's. Kids having to really exercise those in every one of those examples. And I have to tell you that when I get going with this, I could go on for two hours or maybe 24 about all the incredible examples of work that we're facilitating because of the fact that our board has really put time and financial resources behind that kind of work. At the same time that we know that across the country that we hear from school district after school district and teacher after teacher frustrations with the test prep curriculum, the worksheeting that, that has to occur in order to prepare kids for tests, and so on. We're trying to close that down just as we try to do startups. And it's great to see Carrie Taylor here tonight because she just emailed me uh, today and said, you know what, my kids are getting ready to do some experimental work and they're going to be developing wikis and blogs and I don't know what else to uh, be able to document their inquiry work and share it out with, with people beyond just me as a teacher. That's the kind of work we're doing all over the system, whether it's at Western or Monticello or Albemarle or Murray High School, our five middle schools, Community Charter Middle, our 16 elementary schools. So that's what this is all about. Now, let me tell you a personal story. When I was a kid, I was born into the, uh, the Cold War. And the reality is I grew up through the Cold War, low country of South Carolina. My dad worked at uh, the Savannah Nuclear Power Plant, otherwise known down there as the bomb plant. <laughs> and so I was really well aware of all the circumstances surrounding uh, the relationship or lack of relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union. And it was kind of a tough time for this country because we lived in a state of, whether it was the Cuban Missile Crisis or our competition with the Soviet Union around the Sputnik era, it was pretty intense. But then John F. Kennedy came along in 1963, and I'd been watching you know, the, uh, the liftoffs of Alan Shepard and John Glenn, our principal and my little wife, first through seventh grade elementary school would pull us all into the cafeteria, and we had a little tiny TV screen sitting on the stage, and all of us, all 400 of us, would be huddled around trying to see that happen. Then in 1963, John Kennedy became president, and he said, we're going to the moon in this next decade, and we're gonna do it, whether it takes one engineer or 10 or 100 or 1,000. And he said to the American public, this is not just about NASA, this is about all of us investing in our future and getting to the moon. And in 1969, that happened. And I was getting ready in another year or so to go off to college. And one of the things that had changed in my life is a focus on what science meant. And I went to college and I ended up majoring in science and ended up actually compliments of the US government getting funding to, uh, to both major in science and then to become a science educator. So at some level, we had an, igni an ignition of passion in me as a result of this kind of work that moved me past the issues of the Cold War, the issues of civil unrest in this country that occurred in that decade that we call the 60s, to really see a future for me as an educator that has been my life's career. And for me, that's what I see a budget is doing, is igniting passion. In kids, whether it's a kindergartner in the giraffe class, or a kid on the, the stage and band at Burley, or a kid that's helping to fix computers for other people over at Monticello, a student at Mesa, or a student that uh, is struggling to learn English that uh, has uh, immigrated into this country, and we're helping them to become a part of our community and of our great nation. That's our work. So our budget is all about that. Now, one of the things that I think is really tough is that we are also in a period of time that is moving at a faster pace than probably has occurred in recent history. That when you think about the last 100 years, in some ways, the distance from 
people in 1889 riding around in buggies to, in 1969, landing on the moon, took a long period of time. Today, Moore's Law, and by the way, Moore's Law was coined by uh, um, a guy who was actually CEO, I think, of Intel in 1965, said technology is going to change rapidly. In fact, we may see acceleration of technologies that occur every two years. I think we'd all agree that right now technology may be accelerating even faster than that. And it's changing our world. And what it may do for us, if we really play our cards right as educators in this country, is to bring a new economy into the United States that brings back to us the world of manufacturing. But it'll be a different kind of manufacturing. And our partnership with uh, the University of Virginia, one of the things that I've learned is that we have this new thing that's called advanced manufacturing. And it's changing the way we think about what kids can do in the future. And it's happening right now. For example, I went over to visit the advanced manufacturing lab in the engineering school and while I was there, by the way, I'm losing my voice a little bit tonight, so don't be surprised. Um, I was handed this after 15 minutes. This was a wrench that was uh, published on a 3D printer. And it's a working wrench. It's made out of ABS plastic, works well. The reality is Jason's working in a place that has this technology today, one of our board members. We have kids using these kinds of technologies in our schools. And what I hear from the head of the manu of advanced manufacturing at the university, who also happens to be a parent of ours, is we might expect to see this technology in people's homes in just five or six years. And the other day I was out at Better Living and shared with uh, the business council for uh, 29 North this technology. And I looked at uh, Mr. Nunley, who uh, uh, is the uh, uh, proprietor of Better Living, and I said, Imagine in five years if people were able to print their own tools. How's that going to impact better living? And he looked at me and was like, wow, I haven't thought about that. So technologies are going to change our workforce. They're going to change our homes. And they're going to change the way we think about citizenship. So we need to move faster in education than we've ever moved. So how's the world around us evolving? Here are a couple of young guys from Richmond. They're actually brothers. They're first generation college students. And these young men are in the advanced manufacturing lab at the University of Virginia. What's fascinating is they have designed and printed a 3D drone. Now you might think that our friends up at NGIC or DIA might think this is kind of interesting technology because one of the things they talk about is the capability for the US Army to be able to drop this technology behind lines or wherever in the world they want to, land on the ground and print out drones, and the next thing you know, they're flying them around. This has been flying around in Albemarle County, and these young guys said, if any schools would like for us to bring this out there, we'd be glad to demonstrate it. Printed in a 3D printer, clipped together, and now it's flying around in Albemarle. And they're uh, certainly uh, having some interesting focus with that. This is what advanced manufacturing is all about, and it will benefit all of us not just the U.S. Army. Mobile devices. There are a few kids in our high schools today that don't have access to mobile devices. One of the things that's pretty interesting about it, though, is that we tend to see them as entertainment tools, not learning tools. One of the things that I know is that that particular device right there, the iPhone, is a more powerful commuting, computing device than the one that was used to put men on the moon. Than the the uh, technology, the computers to put men on the moon. More powerful. Our kids have them. One of the things that we know is we don't use them effectively for kids as learning tools. But I predict in the next five years that we're going to see this as becoming an emerging technology. And this is one of the reasons why. In December, when I opened up my mailbox, I pulled out my last print copy of the Newsweek. It's no longer printed. It's now a magazine that I can only access digitally. Over a year ago, Britannica printed its last paper encyclopedia. Within the next five years, our kids will be living in a digital content world. We will in our homes, and we can't wait for that to happen and then try to catch up to it. We need to be able to anticipate that as we move forward, and our budget is a way that we anticipate that. We opened up our Health and Medical Sciences Academy this year. 
one of the areas of impetus for that for me was really learning how is the world of medicine changing. Interestingly, this world of telemedicine is one that, that is going to become more and more a part of our lives. I actually uh, learned uh, that um, when Beth Shriver's wife was in an accident up in, in Delaware, that her medical treatment was taken over by the University of Virginia down here until they could get her transported. And the way they did it was through telemedicine. This is a different world that's coming, and the tools and skill sets that kids will need and the kind of jobs that will be available will get shaped by that. And then lastly, some people say, well, yeah, but what about just the regular jobs, Pam, the service kind of jobs? This is actually a picture of one of our auto mechanics over at the bus garage. And he's on a bus. I was there with him last year. He's got his laptop. He's plugged it into the front of the bus. He's downloading all the data off of the bus and working on what do I need to do for maintenance work and what potential repairs need to be made. So it doesn't matter what jobs kids are going to go into. They are going to likely need to be able to evolve and adapt to new technologies in their world. And we need to be anticipating that as a part of the work that we do. But I don't want to ever neglect that when I think about our vision, our mission, our goals, and our uh, core values, that the most important thing that we have to keep in front of us are the faces of our young people. That the reason we do our work, the reason we think about enabling technologies, enabling spaces, and making sure that we have great teachers and educators everywhere our kids turn in our schools today is because of those faces. So while change is moving at a rapid pace around us in our homes, in our families, in our schools and in our workforce, the major thing that we have to remember is we teach kids. And technology doesn't deliver learning, teachers do. So we want everybody to graduate so that they can process more information than has ever existed at any moment in time and it grows exponentially every day. Our kids get a lot of noise in their environment from media, all kinds of media. What we have to be able to do is to teach them to take apart the noise, to analyze it, to evaluate it, so that they can really develop informed opinions in order to be members of a democratic citizenry. We also know that in the workforce, that our kids need to be able to adapt and evolve rapidly to the changes that are occurring there. And I just read a New York Times article in the fall that said, if you're not learning every day in a private business or company, then you're probably putting them behind the curve. We need to have kids who see themselves as learning every day, and we need educators who see themselves as learning every day. And then lastly, I think that's what's really important, is that everybody is going to, in some way, end up taking some version of post-secondary education. And the reality is that our kids need to be equipped and prepared to walk out into a world that's going to be virtual and some blend of face-to-face -face as learners. And we need to make sure that our budget is aimed towards all three of these, not just one. Sometimes I think that we're victims of our own success. We've put so much focus on academic success in school, and our kids perform at the highest levels possible. We really are a, a school division that's distinguished, and we have many schools that are distinguished by the work that we do. You can see here that whether it's uh, the percentage of our kids that are getting the blue ribbon of diplomas in Virginia advanced studies, whether it's SAT scores, whether it's the way the governor assesses the uh, quality of our schools, whether it's our, our musicians, our artists, in terms of their uh, distinguished efforts at the state, national, and even international levels. It doesn't matter how we look at it. Our teachers and our kids distinguish us. And I would say that one of the things that really gets represented here is that our budget has been about educating for the whole child and not just those academic successes. But we tend to still think of our successes through that lens alone because that's the way the state and the federal government tends to assess us. So in some ways, one of the things that we, we sometimes do is we limit ourselves when we don't really think about that holistic picture of how do we continue to inform and move the arts, wellness, health, and most importantly, uh, our kids' capability to think deeply. So what's the climate that's out there in terms of our finances? Um, We've got some good news, and I think we've got some bad news out there, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, on our first list, one of the things that I anticipate we'll be moving off, so you won't see it again next year, is bus replacement. Um, we believe that bus replacement is getting moved over to CIP. All indications tell us that that will happen. Uh, sequestration is the bad news. 
I thought we might have more information at this point. We don't. We're not real certain how it's going to impact us in terms of federal funding for things, whether it's Title I teachers or whether it's special education. Uh, so those are some of our current operational challenges. Instructionally, you're going to see a little bit later some of my uh, frustration around world languages programming. But we also know graduation requirements are changing, that our kids are being subjected to more and more requirements as a part of their diplomas. And so we know that that is a challenge because it means that we have to think about time, space, and our schedules a little differently to make sure our kids are heading in the right direction there. Um, they're just being asked to do more and more with the same amount of time that we've always had for them. And then lastly, our watch list. Obviously, you've heard about the safe schools as being an area that we see as next year um, that, that Dr. Haas may be coming forward with you uh, with some areas of concern about maintaining some of those services. And then, of course, 21st century learning, which I see as being um, companion to and integrated with the three R's. We need kids who can think analytically, write analytically, read analytically, and solve mathematical problems analytically in addition to communication and some of the other things that we know are critical. So, some of the meat of, of this funding request. First and foremost, I want to point out to you that compared to 2008-09, we still have not restored the level of funding that we had in terms of investment in our young people um, through per pupil revenues. In fact, if you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the data there would suggest that if we were funding our kids today at the same level of services that we did in 2008-09, taking inflation into account, we would be at $12,600. So think about that. We know that our kids, and I said this to you a year ago, that our kids that are seniors this year have less funding behind them than they did when they entered high school. Maintenance of effort, what does it mean? The folks around the table know what that means. Folks in the audience may not all realize what it means. Maintenance of effort just means that we are basically sustaining our commitments to things such as growth, making sure that our mandates are, are met, and that inflation is taken into account. So if the cost of fuel goes up, we have to take that into account in this budget. What it does is it also, when we're in a maintenance of effort mode, it limits our capability to bring forward new initiatives that we may consider really important ones. So I come back to the moon story. Kathy Thornton said uh, recently, retired astronaut talking to a local Rotary Club that I happened to hear. She said, you know, NASA stopped its space shuttle program because they realized if they didn't, they would never get back to their mission and out of low orbit to really do deep space exploration. I believe the same thing's really true of us in education, that if we can't see how we bring our budget to bear to really focus us on getting out of low orbit, that we will continue to circle the globe in a world that is about test prep cargo and about what the federal and the state mandates are and not get to that vision work that we all think is so important. I think our budget is what helps us get to our moon moment. Here's one. This year, our facilities folks, technology folks, and our instruction folks got together and said, you know, we put a lot of resourcing out in schools, but we maybe could do a better job if we strategically focused our resources together and so one of the things that they did was they challenged teachers back in the, uh, the uh, before the winter holidays and said, we would like to see project work in schools that represents our moon moment, that represents our focus on how we advance, how technologies enable our kids as learners, how space changes enable our kids as learners, and most importantly, how our pedagogy shifts enable our kids as learners. So that great teaching, how do we support that? And so one of the things that they did was they redirected how they were looking to deploy some of that funding and brought that together to challenge teachers. And I have to tell you, we have schools across the county that have submitted some fabulous proposals that we're getting ready to redirect funding towards so that it's actually a systemic way of focusing it versus as separate departments. We think we will both leverage it in a more efficient way and a more effective way. We also are about implementing the four C's talked about those a few minutes ago, but we also believe that part of that is not just the four C's, but also the three R's, so that we see the integration of those as getting us to where we want to go. Now, the funding request. You always want to know, it's the moment you're waiting for. What's the anticipated revenue? What are the anticipated expenses? Here we go. Good news is 
we don't have a five million dollar funding gap. Bad news is we still have one that's somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.5 million. A year ago this time when I was doing this for you, I was telling you really bad news. We're in a better place than we were. So we've got about uh, a 1.47 million dollar funding gap. Here's how the sources lay out in terms of revenues from federal, state, and local. We're seeing more and more of an effort of the federal government, the state government, to attempt to control what local school boards do, and at the same time, providing less revenues to do it. You have seen, and you will see this, that in this year, that our local revenues are our greatest level of support, and it's inching upward. So, here's what the revenues look like. Um, you can see that, that we have approximately $460,000 that we are looking at as a change inside our local transfers. Those are things like rental agreements and activity funds and things like that. State revenues are inching up by about $370,000. Uh, our local share from local government right now is at $2.51 million. Uh, we're anticipating we're using less fund balance this year, so you'll see those uh, actually dropping a little bit. So when you look at the change, we have about $2.72 million in additional new revenue this year. Now, what about expenses? These are the changes. I'm not going to go into great detail on this because Jackson's going to have an opportunity to be up in uh, front of you in just a few moments. Uh, Billy will be following, Dr. Hahn will be following him with some focus on instructional support. And Vince Schreiber will be here on Thursday night to do a bigger breakout by some of our departments. But what you will see is when you look at that, is that our overall increases in terms of percentages are only 2.77%. So we're pretty pleased that we were able to hold the line. We're going to show you how. Now, what are some things that we assume? These are the, the assumptions that we worked from this year. Um, our free and reduced lunch rates have increased. That drives changes in our uh, um, uh, staffing needs because of differentiated staffing. We also predicated at that 2% salary increase for employees. Uh, based on competitive market and the governor's expectation that we give a 2% raise to our teaching staff, despite the fact that we're not getting a lot of money from the state to help with that. That we would move school plus replacements over, um, and that if there's any changes that occur over time relating either staffing uh, for class size or scale gymming changes, that can cause your expenses and revenues to shift either direction. And then, of course, that uh, we're going to have some increases in enrollment, and as you know, VRS is... Uh, steady, but is taking a, a bigger chunk of our uh, uh, revenues this year because of the fact that we've got to pay for operationally that 5% increase we did last year. So tier one, what's in it? Tier one is about $3.26 um, million um, in initiatives. Most of those are what you would describe as being in almost, in fact, almost all of them. Market competitiveness, salaries, maintenance of effort, growth, uh, mandates, and then instruction is one simple initiative that we have this year that's partial mandate and partially something that we think we need to do, and that is to build a virtual learning program. As you know, next year, all students entering ninth grade beginning next year will need to have a virtual <coughs> learning course on their transcript to graduate. We have to start making a plan for that now, which means building out professional development for teachers. It also means that we need to focus on what tools and what are the resources we need. That's what we have in place right now for that. Um, it's mandated, but it's also something we know is changing in the world of our kids today anyway. Budget reductions, what I will tell you is that we are looking at about $3.4 million of reductions inside our current budget in order to be able to get to that $3.2 million in a new <coughs> tier one. So what's in that? Um, we're going to be letting you go through departments in much more detail, but these are the things that we really see as part of that. Um, growth due to enrollment, 23.64 um, FTEs. Uh, CSA, you know that we're having increased cost in that area. Um, special education staffing, uh, KTAC, PrEP, there are, are places here where you will see increases in our expenses. Most of them are due to just the cost of doing business. The virtual course, there's the breakdown of what that will cost us. Uh, one FTE that will be responsible for helping to, to put that all together. 
um, and then some cost associated with uh, both professional development as well as uh, other things related to program focus there. Market competitiveness, you'll see how that breaks down. As I pointed out to you, that the bulk of the cost of a teacher salary increase accrues to the local. And the state, despite the fact that the governor has said he'd like to see everybody give that 2% raise, we will only get approximately $340,000 to help defray the cost of that here locally. A little bit of health increase and dental increase. So what are the things that we reduced to get here? Um, real quickly, this is the list. We moved buses to Capitol. Uh, we're anticipating both decreases in um, the uh, anticipated cost from what we project for the cost of salaries for teachers to what they may actually cost in another year. We can't really tell you exactly because we don't know who's going to get hired, but we anticipate that we'll, using trend data, that we'll get some savings there. Jackson will be going into more detail on this. VREP, we're starting to see this year for the first time some returns on phasing that program down. So those are cost savings there too. And then we, during the year, have positions that, that lapse for a while in terms of filling them, and we recruit accrue some savings from that. One of it's trend data. Yes, it is. So, what would we be doing if I was bringing forward to you some of the things that I think are really important for us as educators to consider, for a board to consider, for our community to consider? Back up. We would be looking at how do we bring our coaching model to its full funding. We should have had, from the very beginning, 10 more positions. We uh, did not put those in because of the, the severe crisis economically the year that we rolled that model out. We rolled that model out primarily for two reasons at that time. One was because it allowed us to leverage staff together and affect cost savings by cutting staff, while also really focusing on what is considered to be one of the best practices out there across the world for changing the expertise of teachers, which is instructional coaching. Um, we would be looking at a full one-to-one -one technology initiative. That would be something we would be bringing to you. And that could potentially cost us in the neighborhood of a million dollars. We would be looking at a world languages program. We've got a school in Design 2015 that's working on piloting some real innovation in that area. We hope to learn something from that because we anticipate that's something that, that we would really like to see in the future in Alcorn County. We think our kids need to be bilingual to be able to work and live in the, uh, the world economy that, that's out there today. We would be looking at year-round opportunities for teachers, a variety of ways for teachers to be able to gain time together to work on lesson redesign, on learning how to use new technologies to be able to hone their pedagogical skill set. We would be looking at how do we not just offer kids the opportunity to participate in some choices such as charter schools or uh, academies or AVID in a, a particular school, but we would also be providing the transportation so no child would be denied that opportunity. We'd be looking at how do we do a better job of really funding facilities planning so that we are able to transform up our schools for the 21st century. Those are some of the kinds of things we would be building in if we were able to say we were beyond the maintenance of effort budget. Now you as a board, in thinking about these, may come back to us and say, We'd like for you to really work on this more in depth as a part of our budgeting process. But we did not see the revenues out there that would support us going down the pathways to educational excellence that we think that these represent. Now, as I get ready to make a transition, I want to tell you a story, and I think it's an important story that uh, occurred for me last week. And it takes us back to both the moon moment, in a way, it takes us to the story of what keeps us passionate about our work, which are our kids' faces. And it also speaks to that some of the decisions that we make may take some investment of financial resources, and some of our decisions simply take the will to do the right thing. I received an email from a parent last week, and this parent said, I want to share with you a story about a principal. And uh, this is an old story, but it's one that I think that you might appreciate. And what this parent said was that, their child, when their child was uh, in third grade, eight years old, was a very gawky, uh, very uh, painfully shy and awkward young lady who was very big for her age. And that she was having some really tough times trying to fit in in school, not so successful academically. And the, the principal and the parents sat down together. 
and the principal said, what really is your child passionate about? And this parent said, my child really loves horses. And she wants to learn to ride horses more than anything. And um, I think this was probably a child who maybe drew horses and you know, talked about horses, and horses were just what was on this child's mind all the time. But school was not, and school was a hard, tough place for her. So the principal said, well, maybe think about what you could do about that. And the parent evidently came back, this is kind of a long email that I got, and said, um, actually, what my daughter really would like to do is to take writing lessons, but it means that she's going to have to get out of school one day a week a little early to be able to go do writing lessons. And this person said, that principal didn't hesitate in saying, yes, let's do that. And this parent said, today we put our horse down, who we eventually bought for my daughter, who took riding lessons, who became a, a young woman who was six foot one, who is six foot one, who is today able to communicate with anybody, anywhere, who has a real passion for learning in life and is just someone that you would never have realized that as an eight-year-old was unable to be able to be present in school as a learner because of, of factors that, that uh, caused her to be a really painfully shy, awkward young girl. And this person said, you have to understand that sometimes what people consider to be maybe an inconsequential decision can be so consequential in the life of a child. And so one of the things that I think about when we think about budget is that we have control over a lot of decisions, and some of them may feel real inconsequential in the moment, but may have great consequence for our kids down the road. And some of them don't cost us a dime, just like that principal's decision. And some of them cost us some real investments and some changes in the way that we do our work in order to be able to get our kids to a place where they can walk into any job, see any pathway as a pathway to work that they will do in their lives, maybe different jobs, but most importantly, that they see themselves as people when they graduate who can be wonderful members of families, communities, who will serve us in this country well, and who most importantly will be people that will take this nation to a greater level of excellence and cause us to move, just as John Kennedy's words caused a nation to move beyond the Cold War, beyond civil unrest, beyond a lot of things that brought the 60s down, that he was able to, through the work that NASA did, to lift the nation by putting people on the moon. That's what I think we're about. We have moon moments. I can't control what DC does. I can't control what Richmond does. But I tell you what, we in this room, everybody that's back there and everybody around this table, has the power and the will to do what's right for our kids. That's what budget's all about. We have tough decisions ahead of us, but I believe that together that we can make consequential decisions for the children that we serve. So thank you. That's me.